Good morning, family. Great to see all of you. I want to begin with some great news. There are people that love all of you. Do you know that? So God keeps bringing new people to our church. We keep adding more chairs. And they come and they're like, y'all are great. How do we become members? So we've had 14 people join the church in the last couple of weeks. Yeah. Uh, they sense God's spirit and his presence. And they are endeared by all of you. Isn't that great? So I... I I'm kind of scanning. There are a bunch of you here this morning. Is there anybody that went through our latest Making at Home class that went through the process and, and are joining today? Is anybody in the service? Yeah? Okay. So we had a few last service, and I got more coming up next service. But just wanted to share that with you. It's a great thing that God's doing, and praise the Lord for that. I want to take a moment, ask you to open up your Bibles to Galatians chapter 2. You're going to find an outline in your bulletin. If you would remove that, pull that out give you a moment to accomplish that. So I have a question for you. How do you personally protect yourself from the sun's rays? How many put on sunblock? 70? Do you put on 70? How many 50s do you have? Yeah, 50s. That's kind of the range. How many have a cool sombrero like this that you wear out? You got to be old to wear something like this. <laughs> so when I go out to the beach or I'm on the bike or especially on weekends when I'm working the yard, I pull out the sombrero. And it does a great job. protects my face and my neck. But the problem is that it impairs my view and my vision. So I have a shed that I keep my tools and my lawnmower in, and the door going in is only five foot tall, and I am six foot tall. So when I have this hat on, I, I don't see, and I, I remind myself week after week as I'm getting the mower out to bend down low enough, and yet week after week, I bang my head, and I get a headache. So last week, I thought, I'm going to be smarter than that, and I'm going to take my hat off before I get into the shed, and it worked fine. And then as I got ready to mow the lawn, I put it back on and hit my head again on a low-hanging pot. And I'm thinking, this is ridiculous. The thing that's supposed to protect me actually brings other injuries. What's the point of my illustration? I would say to you that many times when we are being criticized, we then go into self-protection mode. We cover up. We're trying to resist what's being said to us. And when we do that, we actually fail to protect ourselves and cause greater injury, not just to ourselves, but to others. Today, as we're studying this passage, we're going to see the Apostle Paul rebuking the Apostle Peter. And what's crazy is that it goes in writing, and it's now been here for 2,000 years. Can you imagine you doing something, and it gets put into the Scripture for thousands upon thousands of people to read? Well, why am I sharing that with you? Because that's what happened in Peter's life, is that Peter lost sight of the gospel. He had a distorted view. And as a result, as you'll see, he's trying to protect himself from criticism. He actually not only caused injuries to himself, critical character flaws begin to show up, but he injures others. He even, as Paul says, leads Barnabas astray in the situation. And I emphasize that point because all of us have been guilty of this at one time or another. We may not always be conscious of that error, but many, many times we, trying to avoid being hurt or injured by criticism, we lose sight of the gospel of grace and problems result. We're going to be studying verses 11 to 18 of Galatians chapter 2. I want to begin by reading verses 11 to 14. And if you'll assist me now that the air conditioning is working, would you please stand? Notice the rebuke that Paul gave to Peter and the context for it. Galatians chapter 2, beginning in verse 11, when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. The other Jews joined him in his hypocrisy, so that by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas was led astray. When I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas in front of them all, 
You're a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it then that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? Thank you. May be seated. So in this immediate context, Paul has been defending the gospel throughout chapter 2. And he continues to come back to the idea that we are saved by grace through faith alone. But the gospel doesn't end at conversion, that the gospel of grace transcends all of life's circumstances. And so when he sees Peter failing to do that, he feels compelled to confront him about this falsehood. And as I've already alluded to, what's more troubling, and this can be the case for us, is that when we begin to veer from the gospel of grace, when our sight is being impaired, is that ultimately others get injured. Now Barnabas is being influenced by Peter's example. And I want to emphasize to all of you here today, people are watching your lives, family members, parents, your children, neighbors. And what Paul is advocating is that we actually represent the gospel of grace well so that we don't bump into these things that we're going to see in this. So we're going to actually see two things that we bump into or the consequence when we lose sight of the gospel. And then one big idea. So with your papers ready and your pens ready, write the first thing that we're going to witness that takes place when we lose sight of the gospel, and that is hypocrisy. We become hypocrites. We do the very thing that we swore we wouldn't do. Direct your attention back to verse 11. Paul wrote, when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. Let me clarify something. If you've been with us for a little while, it's weird how Paul keeps going back and forth between Peter and Cephas. And you might be saying, well, who's Cephas? Cephas is the Hebrew or Aramaic name for the rock. Now, if you're familiar with Jesus, when Jesus called Peter, Peter's name was Simon, right? And he says, you'll no longer be called Simon. You will be the rock. So in Greek, the rock is Petrus, and that's where we get Peter from. But in Hebrew, it's Cephas or Kephas. And so why is Paul using that name more than just everybody knows him now as Peter or Petrus? Why does he keep using that? Because as you're going to see as we get deeper in this text, what he's witnessed from Peter is that he can't seem to figure out exactly who he is. Am I a Jew? Am I a Gentile? And his identity is distorted because he's departed from the gospel. And that can happen to all of us if we really aren't clear of where we find our worth and our value, and it's in Jesus Christ. Keep reading me, verse 12. For before certain men came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because He was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. So additional uh, context. I mentioned last week that this particular subject that Paul is addressing, the timing, took place around the time that Acts 15, and I shared the story about the Jerusalem Council. Remember, Paul and Barnabas, they're up in Syria, northern part of Syria, in Antioch, right on the coast, and they're sharing the gospel for a whole year, and revival is breaking out. Primarily Greeks that live in that town, that city, are coming to faith in Jesus Christ, and they're getting saved, and people are being healed, and it's miraculous. But then, as Paul references, these Judaizers, or Jews from Jerusalem, show up, as he puts it there, from James, and they've heard the stories, and they began to cause conflict, and as a result, Paul has to confront these Jews, and they go back to Jerusalem to get the matter settled, and we call it the Jerusalem Council. So they go to the leaders of the church, which was John and Peter and James, the half-brother of Christ, to get this resolved. Now, many are concerned and wondering, when does this particular incident take place? Some say it was after the council. When Paul and Barnabas went back up to Antioch, Peter shows up. I tend to believe it was before that. And let me explain why, because it makes a lot more sense. As we know from Acts and Paul's own story, this great revival is happening. And more than likely, Peter heard about it and decided to travel up and spend time with them. And that's how this particular confrontation happened. The one that we see in Acts chapter 15, verse 1, where these individuals came, that's exactly what he's talking about then in verse 13, 12 and 13. Now, as I share that, this is how I believe, based upon what we see in Acts, it took place. Last Sunday... 
If you were here, you remember after the 930 service, we had this awesome barbecue for the parents and their kids. And after the service, I peeked out, and there were parents and their children chowing down on hot dogs, and the kids were excited because there were water slides, and there was just this sweet fellowship that was going on all over the campus. I imagine that's exactly what was happening when Peter traveled to Antioch. He'd heard about the great things that are happening, and one of the things that you notice that Paul is upset about is that they would have these family meals, church meals, after every service, and Peter got to participate. So before his friends from Jerusalem showed up, there's Peter sitting down with all these Gentiles, having this awesome meal, probably eating hot dogs, no water slides, but probably hot dogs. And everybody in Antioch has heard of Peter, the famous Peter. He'd walked with Jesus, one of the three that was the closest, Mount of Transfiguration. Peter's having lunch and hot dogs with us. And I would suspect at different times, he began to share stories. I could just imagine the children sitting around on the ground, listening to Peter talking about what it was like to live and walk with Jesus for three years. I venture to say, he probably told the story about how he met Jesus. It was that time, remember? He'd been fishing all night, didn't catch a single thing. Peter's, Peter's now exhausted, and Jesus shows up on the shore, and he says, hey, take your net, throw it on the other side. And Peter had to be going, you got to be kidding me. I've been fishing all night long. Ten feet isn't going to make a difference of how many fish I catch. And do you remember what happened? Peter obliges Jesus. He throws the net on the other side. The net is so filled, the boat begins to sink, and they have to call for help. Can you imagine the kids hearing that story for the first time, sitting on the ground? Their mouths had to be wide open going, that is so awesome. And Peter is having sweet fellowship until his friends from Jerusalem come. And when they show up, Paul says his whole attitude changed. He witnessed Paul, or Peter witnessed these individuals coming, and all of a sudden he's concerned about his reputation. And as a result, his faith begins to fade. I make this assertion, when your faith fades, your convictions fail. They're canceled. What do I mean by that? Let me go back to what I shared with you last week. This is the same guy, Peter, who earlier, through the inspiration and the vision of the Holy Spirit, goes to a man named Cornelius, a centurion, a Gentile, and watches the power of God move in a mighty way. And he realizes, he's affirmed again, that the net of salvation is open wide and that God cares about all nations, all people. And he is one that testified to this. And yet here he is sometime later denying that truth and being prejudiced and not sitting with the Gentiles that he had been for days and weeks earlier. How does that happen? How do you go from being a person who believes something to denying that belief? It's a failure to really drill down on the evidence and the truth of what God has shown you. And as a result, your convictions get canceled. You don't actually carry out what you believe. It happens all the time. Let me share a story that will lead us in. How, how could that happen to us and how do we avoid it? The picture comes on the screen. Two Fridays ago, Monica and I were blessed to have the young marrieds over to our house for a barbecue. And they were to arrive about six. So a little before six, I got the barbecue ready, put some tinfoil on the grate so that it get, wouldn't get messy. And I started putting hamburgers on. At first, there were one or two that showed up, and when they arrived, I turned around and greeted them. But all of a sudden, about 10 after 6, 10 showed up. So I turned around, and I'm welcoming them and talking. And when I turn back around, there are five burgers on fire. <laughs> and there's a flame that's like five feet going up. And I look, and there's a grease fire. And I'm thinking, oh, my goodness, I'm going to set the whole house on fire. And so I quickly got the five burgers, and I put them into a tray, and I lifted the tinfoil that was on fire, put it on the ground, and stamped it out. And the crazy thing, when I turned around, nobody even noticed. I mean, they're feet away from an inferno. And so suddenly, they see burgers in the tray, and they start lining up with their buns. I'm ready for my burger. And I said, well, I don't really know if you want these. And they, they look fine. I said, well, let's cut them open to make sure. Well, they were done on the outside, but they were what? In the middle. Raw. Raw. When I share that story, that is a picture oftentimes of people who portray in the outside to be mature, complete, well done. But in the inside, metaphorically speaking, they're raw. They, they haven't developed. They haven't 
finish their faith. That's Peter. That's Peter that he hasn't really drilled down on the inclusion of the gospel that says all people are saved through faith in Jesus Christ, not by doing the works, the good works. So he caves, and we've all done it. We've all become hypocrites. Let me just give you a few examples of how I watched it through the years. I've watched students who've ousted a friend in their group because a bully begins to malign that individual, and they boot them out. And they're injured, and there's hypocrisy. These are Christian suits. I've watched this happen. I've watched parents who were friends, tight friends with other parents. They're raising their kids, and suddenly their kids get to that age where they have to begin to discipline them, and they have difference of opinions and philosophies about how to discipline. And all of a sudden, these parents that have been good friends disassociate. I won't have anything to do with them. I, I can't believe that that is how they would discipline their children or fail to discipline their children. I've watched individuals who come to church, positions of leadership, and turn right around and go to work and curse and cuss and use God's name in vain. I've watched men, husbands, who come faithfully to church with their wives do that for weeks, months, only to be discovered that they're committing adultery with another woman. Nobody around even notices. One last example. One was a heartbreaking one of an individual in middle school who began to be, become addicted to pornography that lasted for nearly 13 years. And through that 13 years, middle school, high school, and college, he was a leader in all the Christian clubs and communities. When he finally came forth and confessed his sin, I asked him the question, why now? Why now are you coming and confessing your sins? Because he began to realize the truth of the gospel is that you cannot cleanse yourself in your own strength. He said, I promise God every time that I failed, I promise, I promise I'll never do it again. And he said, for a while I would do well. And the next thing I know, I go right back to it. He understood what John taught in 1 John 1, where he said that we have to bring ourselves into the light. We have to come clean first and foremost to God. John said, if you deny your sins, you live in darkness and the truth is not in you. But if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Hypocrisy happens. We've all done it when we have somehow thought that we could live the Christian life in our own strength. And so Peter had failed to do this. He, he, he was living a life that on the outside looked mature and complete. He'd walked with Jesus, but now his convictions crumbled, just like the young man that I described. Here's the scripture that speaks to this issue that will lead us to our action. As it comes on the screen, it's from Hebrews chapter 5, verse 14. Would you read it out loud with me? Let's say it together. But solid food is for the mature who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. As the action comes up the screen, would you please write down what we must do? We must learn to deepen our beliefs. The verse that I just had you read comes from the passage I want you to camp out in tomorrow. I want you to write down three things that accompany that, and then I want to give you a context of how we can live this out and avoid hypocrisy. Please write down the word perceive, perceive, process, and practice. Perceive, process, and practice. So what you're going to see from this author tomorrow in Hebrews as he's talking about those that are immature and they're on the milk and why haven't they grown up? Why are they not mature? What you'll see in the larger context is that they fail to really look intently into the word of God and perceive truth. Did you hear me on that? Look up for just a moment. I just want to make sure that all of you are tracking with me. They fail to look faithfully and consistently into the word of God. They operated and made decisions based upon their own presumptions, their assumed wisdom, and their own strength. And what this author will argue is that when you begin to look intently into the word of God, you begin to perceive truth. Let me use the term discipline or the characteristic discipline as my example. We oftentimes look at discipline as something negative. I'm being disciplined, and we, we somehow associate with being punished. The author of Hebrews will get to chapter 12, and he says, no discipline is pleasant at the time, but over the course of time brings about righteousness. 
So in other words, what he's alluding to is that all of us need to grow in discipline, including your pastor. Discipline is also not just a character trait. It's a fruit of the spirit. We get the Galatians 5. Paul will use it, the term self-control. And here's, as you're perceiving, let's use that one example, as you're perceiving truth, the truth of discipline, and you begin to grow in that, you begin to see other ways that it's being taught in scripture. And one of the things you begin to discover is that, wow, as James talks about in James chapter three, that no one can control their tongue. They need the help from God. Discipline helps you to start controlling your tongue. Discipline helps you to be a better listener. Discipline helps you to control your thoughts. It gives you greater attention. It helps you to walk in the spirit. It teaches you how to hear the voice of God. Discipline is something that all of us need to grow in. As you begin to perceive it, then you begin to process it. You begin to contemplate and consider how discipline will benefit you and what God is doing through your trials to increase your discipline. And as that happens, you move to practicing it. You're sitting with somebody over coffee and they're sharing their hearts and everything in you wants to fix it for them. You have five different answers to tell them and how this will resolve it. And you can finish this conversation because you're done. But the Holy Spirit will speak as you've been meditating and following this and says, be still and listen and attentive. Don't say a word. This isn't for you to fix. This is a practical example of what happens when we begin to grow in our beliefs and our convictions. It has practical implications, the gospel of grace. Here's the second thing that we learn from Peter's mistake, and that is that we lose sight of the gospel, we bump into duplicity. We become double-minded. We say one thing and we do another. It's confusing, it causes conflict, it brings hurt and injury. We've all done it, and Peter as well. Look at verse 14. Paul goes on to say, when I saw that they were not acting in line, pay attention to that one thing, not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas in front of them all, you are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it then that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? Uh, my brother-in-law is a police officer in Orange County. Back in the day when he was on patrol, particularly at nights, he said the most common arrest that they would make every week was DUIs. And so his practice was is that he would be in neighborhoods near bars at 2 a.m. when they would close. And they would watch the people driving around, and he'd follow those who were driving erratically. And he would pull them over, and he would take them through a sobriety test. There was a variety of different things. But one of the things that was consistent that he would do is called the walk and turn. And so part of the exercise to find out if they were sober is could they listen to the instructions and actually follow them, but carry them out. And so the driver then was asked to then stand and walk a line, heel to toe. They're to do nine steps in a straight line. And when they reach the ninth, they're to turn around, do the same thing, and walk back. And what he said was, is that first they would struggle with the instructions, but then they couldn't walk a straight line. They couldn't follow that and stay forward. That image that you have of someone stumbling and falling around is the idea that Paul had when he used that phrase, not acting in line. Orthopodeo is the Greek word that's used there. And literally, this is what it means. Not straight footing towards the gospel. Did you get that? Not straight footing towards the gospel. Peter's stumbling around as his Jewish friends come from Jerusalem. And they begin to say, were you eating with them? I mean, that guy over there, it's not even circumcised. That person over there, they're, they're eating hot dogs. And they're not kosher hot dogs I'm talking about. And all of a sudden, Peter is stumbling around in his beliefs and his convictions, he's not walking straight-footed towards the gospel. And so all of a sudden, he's double-minded. As we see that taking place, all of us at different times have made that mistake. Look at how Paul goes on to give the summary of what he's observed. Verse 15, we who are Jews by birth and not sinful Gentiles know that a person is not justified by the works of law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Stop right there for a moment. What is Paul talking about? We're not sinful Gentiles. What he's saying is he's talking about Peter. He's saying, Peter and I should know better. We were born Jews. We were raised in the old covenant system. We know exactly what the writer meant in Hebrews when he said that the blood of bulls can never take away guilt. 
We watch thousands upon thousands upon thousands of lambs being slaughtered, and we never felt any better. We never felt closer to God, and we never felt like our sins had been paid for. And he says, we, of all people, should know better. Because when Jesus Christ came and the perfect sacrificial lamb died on the cross and he said, salvation is grace is through me, all of a sudden our sins are not just covered, they've been paid for, taken away, removed as far as the east is from the west. And at that point, we have the privilege to come literally in the presence of God. Paul says, Peter, how could you make that mistake? Why would we want to go back living a way that never brought blessing and freedom in life? Now, as I share that, let me finish his comment and bring it back to us. Still in the middle of that verse, he picks up, know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too Peter, we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of law because by the works of law, no one will be, help me, Cornerstone family, justified, forgiven, redeemed, healed. You go down the list of what that means and implies. You say, okay, fascinating. What does that have to do with us? I don't know everybody here, and I certainly don't know who is watching online. So I want to begin by saying, if you're someone who has thought that getting into heaven requires you to be perfect and do good works, and you're evaluating how many good works you've done, how many individuals you've helped, how much money you've given to the poor, and you're hoping that your good works are going to outweigh your bad works, I can tell you it's impossible. You know why it's impossible? Because you've already sinned. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You can't bring, the prophet Isaiah says, that our righteousness or our good works are like filthy rags to God. We're bringing our little human puny efforts to a perfect and holy and eternal God and say, like that? Will you forgive me of all the stuff I've messed up and take that as a payment? It's impossible. So Jesus Christ, the perfect son of God, paid for our sins. And so Paul says that is the beginning. Now, as I say that, if you've not done that, I'm in my closing prayer, I'm appealing to you to receive God's gift of salvation and quit trying to work your way to heaven. But many of you, as I look out, I know you, and I know your testimony, and I know your faith and trust in God. I ask you, have there been times where unwittingly you've gone back to try to gain God's favor by doing more good works? Here's just one example. Would you all agree that reading the Bible is a good thing? How many would say, yes, that's a good thing? Have there been times in the past, maybe even the present, where you start reading the Bible because you know you should, and part of you thinks that this will kind of gain favor with God? And so you read, and 15 minutes later, you can't remember anything that you read. But you feel a little bit better because you checked it off the list. That's an example of what I'm talking about, how as Christians, we can backtrack and forget what the gospel is about. When you keep your sight on the gospel of grace, you long to read God's word, not so you can check it off the list, but because you begin to believe that the God of the universe cares about you and actually wants to speak into your life at that very moment. That just as I argued already, that a consistent diet of God's word, you actually begin to hear God's voice and he begins to give you affirmation. Some of you need affirmation so bad and you're looking in the wrong place. You begin to feel and sense God's affirmation, his unconditional love. You find his direction, his approval, his insight, his wisdom. Wouldn't you agree that that's a lot better than checking something off the list, leaving, not having any benefit, and not really feeling better? That's what Paul is advocating. That's what he wants us to see. He wants Peter to see. Where we are poor, Christ is poor rich. Did you get that? Where you and I are poor, where we fall short, Christ is absolutely rich. Parents, do you ever feel like you kind of fall short? Don't raise your hand. Ever lose your temper? Ever get frustrated at your children? Ever have conflict in your marriages? Ever singles feel lonely and desperate and think, I would do anything to, to finish this loneliness? Where we are poor, Christ is rich. 
wherever we fall short, wherever we need God's grace, the promise is you can come to him and he will meet your need and fill you up. He'll help make up the difference. So here's what we need to do. We need to learn to make up our mind. On Wednesday, I want you then to reflect on this passage in Romans chapter 8, Romans 8, 5 through 8. What you're going to see is that this passage that Paul wrote in Romans is going to parallel where we're going in Galatians. And what Paul is essentially going to say is, you're double-minded if you're living by the flesh and trying to live by the Spirit. When you're trying to do good works in the flesh in your own strength, he says you're going to fail. And he says, if you are then in bondage to your flesh, an example is from the examples that I shared earlier. If you're addicted to something, if you can't control your tongue, if you're doing everything in your own effort, he says you're giving in to pleasure. You're not saying no. It's evidence that you're living a Christian life in your flesh and you cannot please God. But he'll go on to say is that, Anybody who has the mind of the spirit is the person that can please God and be a blessing and live in that space successfully. And he's saying that way, you're not double-minded. Write down these three things for me, okay? This is what's absolutely critical. If you're going to succeed at this, you have to be mindful. Write down the word correct, caring, and counsel. Correct, caring, and counsel. You have to start. If you're going to be successful, you have to start with always agreeing every single day that God is always correct. Did you get that? God is always correct. Now, as I say that, I see some of you nodding. It's like, yeah, absolutely. But can we be honest that there are times where in our subconscious, we don't actually believe that? Like when God tells you, maybe today he's telling you, you need to go forgive that person. You need to apologize. You need to accept responsibility. And your mind, you're like, yeah, but they don't really deserve it. Do you know what they did to me? When you do that, you don't agree that God is correct. You're constantly looking for an escape clause that says, oh, that applies to him, but not to me. God is always, always correct. Some of you can get to that place, but you struggle to obey because you fail to remember. Second, God is always caring. If God truly does care about you and he gives you the difficult job, hypothetically, to go forgive somebody, even when he knows it may not go well, his heart is for you, he's compassionate, and he will then walk with you through the process as well as for your healing. He'll give you divine insight to what's going on with that person if they were combative. God is for you. He is a caring God. And when you've done the first two, you become more open to his counsel. God wants to give you counsel, wisdom, and guidance. And it's worthy of our pursuit. Absolutely. All right, here's the big idea, the take-home truth. When we lose sight of the gospel, we bump into futility. It starts with hypocrisy. It then leads to duplicity. But ultimately, if we keep going down that path, it's futile. Now, verses 17 and 18, the last two verses we're going to look at, it's a bit confusing. But if you bear with me, I'll do my best to explain what Paul's saying and help us see how it fits our lives. Verse 17, but, so this is a compare and contrast. Starts with the conditional clause, if. So he's just talked about the fact that we've been justified by faith in Christ. Our sins have been forgiven. We've been redeemed. But if we do this, here's the problem. But if in seeking to be justified in Christ, we Jews find ourselves also among the sinners, doesn't that mean that Christ promotes sin? What is he saying? Essentially what he's declaring, still referencing Peter, is if we actually agree with these Judaizers that have come up from Jerusalem and that, yes, we need to put our faith in Christ, but that's not enough, we still have to follow all the law and do our best to please God this way. He says, if we agree with that, when Jesus Christ himself said that I am the way, the truth, and the life, no man comes to the Father but through me. Salvation comes through faith and grace alone. If Jesus himself said that, and Jesus is saying that's how we find salvation, isn't Jesus actually saying that if we don't obey the law, we're to sin? If, they, if this is a true statement, the Jews say that not obeying the law is that we're sinners, isn't Jesus then promoting sin and saying, it doesn't really matter, just keep on sinning? Look at what Paul's response to his rhetorical question is. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. That's not what Jesus teaches. And he says, he makes this statement because everybody knows that. It's understood. His closing comment, verse 18, if I rebuild what I destroyed, then I really would be a lawbreaker. In other words, if I went back to thinking that that was actually a true statement, I went back to living that way, I'm actually disobeying Christ and I'm breaking his law. 
His law is you obey all the commandments by doing one main thing, loving the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And number two, love your neighbor as yourself. So Paul says, if I go back to trying to please God and find his favor by following all these rules, I'm actually disobeying the main command of loving God and doing what Christ said. He says, so we have to come back then to the center of what the gospel teaches us, that this is how we live. So I want to finish with one brief illustration that will take us to the action. So I'm looking out, and there's a few young people here, but mostly I think everybody's old enough to have a license. Is that true? So I'm assuming that at one time or another, those of you that drive, that you've had to drive into the sun. In my situation, when I come to church in the morning, the sun is behind me. When I go home in the evening, it's also behind me. Rarely do I have to drive in the sun. But you know all the crazy construction that's going on around town? I found myself last week trying to get to the dentist, and a detour was taking me at 7 in the morning right back to the east with the sun glaring in my eyes. When that's happening to you, what is the first thing you do when you can't see the road because the sun is so brilliant? What do you do? Put the visor down. Right. Jeanette, we put the visor down, and then we're kind of trying to drive looking around the visor, and, and then like, oh, wait, I got sunglasses, and, the, and I pull those out, and at the same time, we're, we're still trying to navigate so we don't run into something. I would say that for you and I, that our solution is to drive to the sun, that we're always, always be heading in the direction towards the sun, capital S. But the problem is that in his holiness and his perfection, it's hard to do, isn't it? When you think about the holiness and perfection of Christ, there's, there's just this holy glare. How do we do that? It's through the gospel of grace. The gospel of grace is the sun visor that you put down. Because at that point, you begin to see clearly of how you continue to move towards Christ. And so the action that comes with that that I want you to write down is learn to focus your eyes on Friday, spend some time in Hebrews chapter 12, where the writer will say, fix your eyes on the author and perfecter of your faith. But once again, I want you to write down three words to make this time of reflection meaningful. Please write down character, works, character, works, and commands. So if you're struggling today in your walk with God and he feels distant, what this writer is advocating when he says, fix your eyes on Jesus, start by reflecting on his character. Every day, I would encourage you at least every week, but every day, stop and reflect on the character and the nature of Christ. Think about what we just talked about, his holiness, his mercy, his power, his concern. You can go down the list, but then as you meditate on that, think about his works. In the Gospels, Jesus says, you don't believe my words, then look at the evidence of my works. Look at how the fact that everything I do shows that I come from the Father. All the miracles. Think about the miracles that Christ did. Now, some of you are saying, well, but that was back in the first century. I don't see those miracles in my life. The fact of the matter is that you're all experiencing the blessing of Christ's resurrection. That's a pretty big miracle. But the fact that God is still at work and he's at work in your life, if you really stop and look at it, you will see that he is constantly intervening, speaking, and acting on your behalf. But last, make sure that you're giving space to think about his commands. Going all the way back to what I started is if God is good and he's caring and he gives you command, then in the power of the Spirit, obey those commands. If you're not obeying Christ's commands, it's a downward spiral. You're going to keep going back to the same thing that he's telling you to do, and you'll continue to be frustrated and disappointed in that. So look at his commands, look intently at it, and follow them. Would you please bow your heads and close your eyes? Going back to a comment that I made earlier, whether you're online or someone here in person, you don't have an assurance of salvation. Your hope has been that God would welcome you into heaven by doing enough good things, and hopefully then he will show mercy to you. But you understand that nobody's going to be good enough to get to heaven, and that's the whole point of Jesus coming. And so today, you're willing, as much as you understand, to say, I will put my faith in Christ Jesus. I will trust him for my salvation and what he did. And if that's you, and you're saying, I'm going to make that decision today, would you just raise your hand where you're at? Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Is there anyone here today that would say, I'm going to trust the Lord Jesus Christ for my salvation and going to heaven? Amen. I see that. Praise God. Are there others? 
Father, I don't know those that are watching online, but I thank you for those that are present. And I thank you that you see that hand. I thank you that right now the, the angels in heaven are rejoicing. And I pray that this individual would feel the blessing of knowing that no matter what they've done, you have forgiven it as, as they have raised their hand and believed in you, Lord Jesus, that you have forgiven and healed and delivered them from that. And I pray right now of the fact that in that choice, that decision is your spirit now comes upon them, that you would make that tangibly real to them and that they would realize that you love them and you have called them. For all the rest of my brothers and sisters that are here today, trusting that they have at some point put their faith in you. If any of them have slipped back, if they've gone back to trying to gain your favor or are doing things in their own strength or have become distant from you, I pray that you would speak specifically into their circumstance and show them what they've neglected and how the relationship has grown stagnant with you because of the fact that they've begun to rely upon themselves or something else other than you. So in light of some of the tangible things that we've looked at in this passage, we bring that back to their mind and give them the, the time and the courage to seize that. And in that space, would you meet them in the most powerful way? It's in your son's name, I pray. And all the people said, amen, amen.